Uh, dear students, I welcome you to my video lectures. I'm your course instructor, Dr. Mazullah Khan. And uh, in today's lecture, we will start with chapter number seven, uh, which is regarding rate of uh, uh, return. Before proceeding to chapter number seven, let me give you a very quick recap of uh, whatever we covered before the midterm. So we started with chapter number one, which was uh, foundations of engineering economy. In that chapter, we started with engineering economics and its usefulness in uh, decision making process. We also covered uh, professional ethics. There are some universal ethics and there are some individual uh, uh, ethics. Uh, in the book, uh, they call it universal morals versus uh, individual morals. At the end of the chapter, in my opinion, which is like the most important part, we covered uh, economic equivalence and the minimum attractive uh, rate of return. So if you ask me what is like the most important part of uh, chapter number one, it is actually the minimum attractive rate of return. So if you did not understand the MARR, uh, please go back and uh, have a look. It's only like half a page uh, content, but it is super important to understand. In chapter number two, we talked about time value of money. And with the uh, examples, of course, I explained to you that what is actually the time value of money. Um, we talked about the importance of interest and I told you that interest is the manifestation of time value of money. Afterwards, uh, we covered some factors for single amounts. Uh, then we covered uh, how do we tackle uniform series. And uh, then at the end of the chapter, we covered the uh, gradients. Okay, we covered both arithmetic gradients and we also covered geometric gradients. In chapter number three, what we did, we combined all those factors. So in chapter number three, we combined all those factors. And there were two uh, uh, main topics that we covered in chapter number three, uh, which was we covered factors with shifted gradients so anything which does not fit the conventional cash flow diagram, uh, normally they are called uh, the shifted uh, gradients. And we also covered situation uh, where there is a gradient, uh, but actually the pattern breaks and there is a random number. Okay, so we have to adjust for that random number in order to uh, uh, make it consistent with the conventional cash flow diagram of either um, geometric gradient or arithmetic gradient. Chapter number four was all about nominal and effective uh, interest rates. Okay, in this chapter we introduced multiple compounding uh, and I also told you different ways how do we account for those compounding in our uh, factors. The first four chapters we learned mainly about tools. Okay, in chapter number three, which was present worth analysis, it was all about using these tools for some analysis. Okay, so present worth is actually an analytical tool. Uh, with present worth analysis, we evaluate different projects and then using a defined decision criteria, we either choose one project or um, let's say more than one project or even one, only one project, let's say if the projects are mutually exclusive. In chapter number six, we talked about annual worth analysis. So present worth analysis and annual worth analysis, as I told you during my lecture, that they are not identical tools, but they are similar tools. Uh, so uh, whatever decision we reach, based on present worth analysis, we will reach the same decision using annual worth analysis. But there are certain advantages of annual worth analysis 
One of the most prominent advantage is that in annual worth analysis, we do not consider what we call LCM. Okay, so we evaluate the project only for one life cycle and that's it. Present worth analysis, if you remember, for example, if project A has six years of life and project B has nine years of life, okay, uh, we had to evaluate project A for three cycles, like the LCM of six and nine is 18. So we had to evaluate the, uh, the present worth of project A for three life cycles and for two life cycles for project B. So that process was uh, very lengthy. On the other hand, annual worth analysis, in annual worth analysis, we are not concerned about the LCM. Okay, we are only concerned about one life cycle and that's it. That was the main uh, advantage. Present worth, as the name suggests, it is all about, so present worth is all about discounting cash flows to t equal to zero. Okay, and whenever I talk about cash flows, I mean cash inflows and cash outflows. Okay, annual worth is actually converting all cash flows, cash flows into equal, okay, annual uh, uh, cash flows. So that is the main difference. So annual worth analysis has a huge advantage for the present worth analysis. Today we will start chapter number seven and in chapter number seven we will start with what we call internal rate of return and we will use that as an analytical tool as well. In today's lecture I will only talk about the understanding part of rate of return. So we will not cover the uh, let's say the calculation part of it but I will only introduce the topic to you and will also tell you about the importance of internal rate of return. So internal rate of return in book it is abbreviated as IROR but in literature by far IRR is the most commonly used abbreviation. So in my presentation I will use this abbreviation IRR although in book it is IROR but I hardly uh, we hardly use this IROR I -R -O -R, um, in practice. It is mostly IRR. So let's say if somebody tells you what is the IRR of the project, okay, it means um, a specific, uh, what's it called, uh, type of analysis. As you remember, present worth is the sum of present worth of all cash inflows and outflows. Okay, so as I told you on my previous slide, present worth is all about bringing cash flows to t equal to zero. So suppose if I have timeline t equal to zero, one, two, three, and four. And let's say I have cash flows, let's say 100, 200, minus 500, and let's say 300, okay? So present worth analysis is bringing is all about bringing all the cash flows to t equal to zero. Okay, so you bring everything to t equal to zero. In other words, you are calculating the present worth of all cash. This is inflow, this is inflow, and this is inflow, and cash outflows. This is outflow because it this one comes with a minus sign. And what was the decision criteria for uh, PW? So if you are using PW as an, in an, as an analytical tool, uh, what is the decision? What are the decision guidelines? So if PW is greater than or equal to zero, we accept that project. Okay, equal to zero means that the project just meets the expectations of MARR. So if you concentrate on this cash flow, I'm discounting these individual cash flows with a certain interest rate. Okay, that interest rate 
is called the minimum attractive rate of return. In some literature, it is also called the required rate of return. Okay, so that is something that I require from a particular project. Okay, so it provides like this. This one is like a threshold. Okay, so M A R R is just like a threshold. So I'm using M A R R to evaluate projects. And if the PW of a project is more than zero or equal to zero, we accept that project. Okay, but let's say if it is equal to zero, it means that the project just meets the expectation of MARR. Okay, if it is greater than zero, in words, it means that the project exceeds the expectation of MARR. And in this situation, okay, the firm is actually creating value. Okay, so their project is uh, creating some value because it is uh, exceeding the expectation of MARR. If you remember from my initial lectures, when I was talking about MARR, okay, we used a word WAC, which is the weighted average cost of capital. So if a company is planning to undertake a project, normally they need financing for that. And there are two main sources of financing. One is equity and the other one is let's say debt. Okay, so of course if somebody is providing equity to finance that project, they have certain expectation in terms of return. So for example, let's say if I'm investing in PTCL or let's say Anglo Chemicals, okay, I have certain expectations for return. So if I'm buying their shares, I think that okay, I'm expecting let's say 12% return on my investment. Similarly, debt holders like the bondholders or uh, even banks, banks provide loans to finance different uh, projects of, of uh, companies. So of course, debt is not for free. Bank is expecting some return. So for example, equity, they are expecting 12% return, the equity holders and the debt holders assume they are uh, expecting 10% return, okay? And assume that the project was financed 40% by equity, okay? So this is weight and the remaining 60% is coming from debt. So you can easily apply these weights, okay? And calculate the weighted average cost of capital, okay? So in this example, this is 4.8, plus 0, uh, 6.0 which is 10.8 percent okay so in this simple example the weighted average cost of capital is 10.8 now why am i discussing this this is super important to understand because if a project is making only 10.8 percent okay so if the return of the project is only 10.8 percent it means that whatever I earn from the project, everything goes to what they call capital providers. Okay. In simple words, if the project is, if the project return is $100, okay, or in other words, simple words, if the profitability of the project is $100, all those $100 are going to the cost of capital. Okay. And there is no value creation. But assume that the project is making, let's say, $150. So $100 will go to the capital providers, okay? And the remaining $50 is contributed towards the company. It, it, it is like a value creation. So if you link this discussion with PW greater than zero, it means that the company that this, that project is actually creating certain value for the company but let's say if the pw is equal to zero it means that the project just meets the expectation of marr in other words translation in other words that the project return is only enough to pay the cost of the capital okay 
Uh, but let's say if PW is less than zero, we reject that project because if we accept that project, it will result in losses. And of course, we do not want to undertake a project which will result in losses. Now, internal rate of return, I ROR, or as I said, I will uh, use IRR, is the rate at which we just recover the initial investment. The rate that equates the sum of present worth of cash inflows or to present worth of cash outflows. Okay, so there are two definitions. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to say something extremely, extremely important. So please pay attention. While calculating the present worth, we are using an interest rate. So I is given. Okay. This I is also called minimum attractive rate of return. Okay. M-A-R-R. But in IRR, of course, I is not given. My job is to calculate I. Okay, so in PW and AW, I is given. Okay, and then we have to calculate the PW and AW. But for internal rate of return, of course, I is not given. My job is to calculate the internal rate of return. So what rate, what is internal rate of return? There are two definitions for it. I is IRR. So the interest rate will be called IRR if the present worth of all cash flows is zero. That is definition number one. Definition number two, the rate at which PW of all outflows is equal to PW of all inflows. Okay, so these are two identical uh, definitions. Okay, uh, they look different, but they are identical. Okay, in PW, as you remember, we do not make any distinction between outflow and inflow. Okay, we just discount all the numbers. Plus sign is of course cash inflows and uh, uh, cash flows with minus sign. They are cash outflows. So the rate at which PW is zero, it is called internal rate of return. The rate at which PW of outflows is equal to PW of inflows, that is also called internal rate of return. Let me give you a very, very simple scenario. So there is project A and we have project B. Okay. And let's say it's a, the project has only three years of life. Okay. Project A has an initial investment of $1,000. Okay. Uh, the cash inflow in year number one is $300 and then $500 and then let's say $700 in year number three. Project B, everything is same except one cash flow. So initial investment of $1,000. And then the first year is $300, second year is exactly $500, but in third year it is actually, let's say, $1,200. Okay, and if I ask you a question, which project is more profitable? Of course, it is project B, because everything else is similar except for the third cash flow. The third cash, uh, the, the cash flow in the third year is $500 more than project A, than that of project A. So in other words, although I did not calculate the internal rate of return, but the internal rate of return I can visually see of project B is higher than the rate internal rate of return of project A. Okay, let's move forward. If I graphically repre uh, represent um, not represent, but let's say plot present worth against uh, interest rate. I have a non-linear uh, relationship between the two. And uh, as you can see that the 
let's say present work is equal to let's say any cash flow divided by 1 plus i raised to power n. So this relationship is non-linear. Okay, you can easily plot these numbers in Microsoft Excel and then you can draw this uh, nice uh, chart. As you can see from the relationship, it is non-linear. Okay, uh, and uh, with increasing i, the PW actually decreases because they are inversely proportional to each other. It has, um, so as you can see graphically, the rate at which your P present worth is zero, their trade is called internal rate of return. Now internal rate of return, and please do not worry about this definition now, okay? I'll give you an example in uh, coming few slides and it will be uh, crystal clear. Uh, but for now, a rate of return is the rate paid on the unpaid balance so that the final paid payment or receipt brings the balance to exactly zero with interest considered. So as I said, although this looks a little bit complicated, but once I give you the example, it is super easy. IRR, it varies between, okay, so the lower bound is minus 100, okay, and there is no upper bound. Why? There is a logical reason behind it. So for example, let's say if I invest $100, okay, how much can I earn? So my earning potential is actually unlimited, infinity. So my $100 may be, let's say, probably $1 million after 10 years. It may be, for example, let's say $1 billion. So there is no uh, limit on the upper bound. So my earning potential is unlimited. Okay, but what about my loss? My loss is actually limited to $100. Okay, so the maximum my a rate of return can go negative is actually 100%. Okay, I cannot lose more than my investment. So that's why the internal rate of return is greater than or equal to minus 100% and less than infinity. Okay, although it's a repetition, but please pay attention. It's important to understand. It's less than infinity because my earning potential is unlimited. Okay, but my loss is limited to my initial investment. Okay, the maximum I can lose is actually 100% of my investment and that's it. Okay, so the definition above does not state the rate of return on the initial amount of investment rather than it is on the unrecovered balance. Okay, I'll, as I said, I'll uh, explain this idea in my um, example. So let's go to an example. Super easy example. So let's concentrate on this one. To get started in a new telecommuting position with Abby Hammond Engineers, Jane took out $1,000 loan at I equal to 10% per year for four years to buy home office equipment. From the lender's perspective, the investment in this young engineer is expected to produce an equivalent net cash flow of 315.47 for four years. Okay, so it's super easy. An individual borrowed $1,000. This was the interest rate, okay? And the money was borrowed for four years. So what would be the yearly installment? Okay, for four years. So this is the way we calculate installment and I'm sure by now you remember that we calculate it through capital recovery factor okay so capital recovery factor for 10% for four years uh, is 0.315 and once I multiply it with 1000 so of course my yearly installment is 315.47 now if you remember from my lecture I told you that this 315 is composed of two components. One is the principal component and the other one is interest. 
Okay. The question is the rate of return on the unrecovered balance. Okay. Uh, sorry. Let me read it through. So this represents a 10% per year rate of return on the unrecovered balance. Compute the amount of unrecovered investment. So this is what I need to find out for each of the four years using the rate of return on the re unrecovered balance. Okay. And the rate, the sorry, the return on the initial $1,000 investment. And explain why all the initial $1,000 amount is not recovered by the final payment in Part B. Super easy. Let's uh, do that. Now, as you can see, if today that individual borrows $1,000, so by end of the day, the unrecovered balance would be $1,000. But if that individual uses that amount for one year, that individual has to pay $100 in interest payment. How did I calculate this one? It is extremely simple. It is this amount multiplied by 10%, which is the interest rate. Okay? And since my installment that I calculated on my previous slide is 315, okay? So out of this 315, this was the interest amount and the remaining was principal. Okay? So my unrecovered balance would now be $1,000 minus 215. So now it is 784. In year number two, okay, I will calculate interest on the, what they call declining balance, on the unrecovered balance. Okay, so two different words, but same meaning. Okay, on the declining balance or on the unrecovered balance. So my interest would be 78.45 again, multiplied by 10% here. Okay, so 784.53 multiplied by 10%. Okay, again, my installment is 315.47. Since I calculated it through capital recovery factor, it means that it will result in similar equal installments. Not similar, but equal installments. Okay, so my installment for each year, as you can see here, is 315.47. Out of this 315, 78 is the interest and the remaining 237 is the principal amount. Now my unrecovered balance is 784.53 minus 237, which is 547. Okay. I did calculation for year number three as well. Okay. So similar calculation, but now pay attention to year number four. My beginning balance, unrecovered balance is 286. My interest would be 28.6, which means this amount multiplied by 10%. Okay. Uh, installment is again similar, 315.47, but pay attention here. Okay. My principal amount, how did I do that? 315 minus this amount, okay, which is this one. And as you can see, it is absolutely the same as the last unrecovered balance. Okay, so after my fourth installment, my unrecovered balance is equal to zero. So this is what really meant by this statement. Sorry, not this statement, this statement. Okay, so please go through this example and read the statement again, and then you should be able to understand it. Okay, so that was solution to this A part. Now, as you can see, I'm calculating this interest on this unrecovered balance all the time. Okay, and as you can see, the interest amount is going down uh, with every installment. Okay, and it makes sense because the unrecovered balance is going down after each installment. Okay. Now, what happens if I calculate the interest all the time on the principal amount? Okay, so of course, every time it will be $100. Now, my installment calculated was 315.47. Okay, and my recovered amount each year is exactly the same. Okay, since this amount does not change, this amount does not change, 
So this recovered amount will also not change. And as you can see, even after paying my last installment, there is still an outstanding balance of minus 138. So the first part was calculation of interest, calculation of, let's say, installment. Uh, okay, not, not installment, let's say interest. on declining balance and in B it is calculation of interest on principal amount and that too on the initial principal amount okay so if you compare this one with the declining balance my interest is actually declining all the time so let's say let me let me put it in a little bit fancy words okay so the cost of borrowing is decreasing uh, what's like a year by year okay here my cost of borrowing does not increase uh, decrease it stays the same okay because the basis of my calculation is one thousand dollars okay so I use the initial principal amount for my interest calculation. So if I ask you a question as a borrower, which form of calculation is more fair to you? Is it calculation as we suggested in part A or is this contract more fair where uh, the bank does not consider the declining balance and they, can, they, they calculate interest rate on the initial principal amount? Of course, if you see the numbers, uh, contract A is more fair because you are paying interest on the money that you utilize. So in, 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 in year number one, the borrower utilized $1,000 for one year and therefore he or she paid interest on that $1,000. In year number two, the borrower utilized $784 and he or she paid interest on this 784 okay and so on and so forth in contract B the borrower utilized money in the first year uh, a money of $1,000 for first year and therefore he or she paid interest on $1,000 but unfortunately in year number two Although the borrower utilized only $784, but he or she paid interest on $1,000. So this one is more unfair to the borrower. Okay, So therefore, in, in, in uh, certain countries, regulators and the government actually restricted banks to use declining balance for their calculation of uh, interest. Okay, So they cannot use... Uh, let's say the kind of calculation that we did uh, in part B because it is more unfair to the borrower okay so what are the decision guidelines for internal rate of return MARR gives firm the idea of the cost of capital so in one of the slides as I told you that WEC provides actually the foundation for MARR. So that's like a benchmark. Uh, so let's say if the VEC uh, of a company is 10% and if the project is returning only 10%, it means that everything is going to the capital providers. Okay, uh, But let's say if MARR is more than VEC, it is creating some value. So firms compare IRR with MARR. So all companies have a certain minimum attractive rate of return. Okay, And as the name suggests, this is the minimum that the company is able to accept. Okay, So what MARR does, MARR is like a benchmark. Okay, So if IRR is more than MARR, the project is economically viable. Accept that project. 
but if the IRRR is less than the minimum attractive rate of return, it is not economically viable. Okay, so reject it. Okay, in other words, pay please attention. If the internal rate of return of the project is less than the minimum attractive rate of return, okay, so it means that the IRR is not good enough for the company. So they just reject it. Okay, uh, these criteria, it guarantees that the selected alternative will earn at least its required rate of return. Okay, it's obvious. If you remember from chapter number one, this provides a very, very logical uh, relationship between ROR and MARR. Okay. As I told you that the rate of return on safe investment, normally we call it a risk-free rate, like the RF. And government securities normally are rated as risk-free. So, uh, for example, uh, Pakistan investment bonds. Okay. And those are called risk-free because government has sovereign guarantees. Okay. They, they, they do not default. So the MARR, has to be more than the risk-free rate and it's obvious for example if a company is undertaking a project it means that they are also um, let's say taking some risk okay so let's say if MARR is 10 percent and for example let's say RF is 12 percent okay it doesn't make any sense why would company take risk and even then make less money. On the other hand, they have an opportunity to earn more money by taking no risk. Okay, so this relationship doesn't hold. Uh, a risk-free return serves actually as a benchmark. So let's say if in an economy the, the risk-free rate is 6%, MARR will always be more than 6%. Okay. Uh, then the project returns they can actually lie anywhere here okay so anything more than MARR is acceptable uh, but of course some project uh, they're more profitable so their rate of return is uh, much higher than MARR uh, but some projects they have a lower rate of return it really really depends on how risky a certain project is and this is a very very important relationship to understand uh, and logical one too ROR should be greater than or equal to your minimum attractive rate of return and the minimum attractive rate of return should be more than the weighted average cost of capital why because if MARR is equal to WAC okay what it really means that whatever the project is earning everything is going to the capital providers it is not creating any value the projects are meant to create some value in the company they are meant to add some value to the company okay uh, if it is only uh, um, giving a return which is equivalent to which is equal to WAC it means that whatever the project is earning all the dollars are going to the capital providers like the equity holders or the debt holders so MARR has to be more than WAC. Okay, why do we need to compare IRR with minimum attractive rate of return? Uh, because MARR is the minimum rate. Uh, it is also called the hurdle rate, the benchmark rate, or the cutoff rate. IRR is the break-even rate. Why do we call it the break-even rate? Because if you remember it, uh, at the beginning of this lecture, I told you that IRR is the rate at which NPV of outflows is equal to, sorry, present worth of outflows equal to present worth of inflows. Okay, so this rate is actually equating present worth of outflows to present worth of inflows. It means that this is the break-even point. So IRR is the break-even rate, okay? Why do we call it the break-even rate? Because at this rate, 
the present worth of outflows is equal to the present worth of uh, inflows. In USA, 75% of the firms, they're using IRR uh, for evaluating financial projects. So this is something extremely, extremely relevant to project evaluation. So a very, very good idea to learn about this uh, technique. Very simple though, very simple. IRR is a relative measure, okay? So we learned about uh, now three different analytical tools. The first tool was PW, which is present worth analysis. And present worth and FW, they are economically equivalent, so they, they fall under the same category. Uh, the other one is annual worth. And the third that we introduced in chapter number seven today, it is internal rate of return. Now, internal rate of return, we call it, it's a relative measure. Why is it a relative measure? Let me give you an example. So suppose if I invest $1, uh, let's say zero, and this is two, okay? And year number two, it is it gives me a return of $1.5. So I can easily tell that my return here is 50%. How did I calculate 50%? because I'm earning 50 cents by investing $1. So it is $1.5 of return minus $1 of investment. So my profit is 0 0.5 and I'm getting 0 0.5 by investing $1, so it is 50%. Okay, uh, but what about, let's say a project, there is another project, for example, let's say zero, one, I invest $1 million, okay and I get $1.5 million. So here, if you see this, although this is a very extreme example, in project A, my return is only 50 cents. So this is project A. In project B, same return, but in dollar terms, it's actually $500,000. Okay, so PW and FW, they are absolute measures, okay? And IRR, it's a relative measure, and that is actually one of the limitations, okay? It is one of the limitations. So for example, based on IRR, uh, I will equally value project A and project B, because both of them are returning me 50%. Uh, I mean, the internal rate of return of both projects is uh, 50%. So that is something uh, which is a limitation to IRR, uh, but still, as I said, 75% of the companies in the US, they are using IRR. So IRR is relative, and uh, PW, FW, and AW, they are absolute measures. Okay, since IRR depends only on the cash flows of the project alternatives itself, the correct term for it is internal rate of return. Okay, we already know about that. Okay, so we are calculating IRR based on the cash flows which are internal to the project. So the project has cash inflows and cash outflows. And the rate is calculated based on those project cash flows internally. And that's why it is called internal rate of return. So as you can see, even if I plot everything on the timeline, all the cash flows relates to a certain project. So there is no external cash flows coming from anywhere. Everything is internal. So that's why the rate itself is called internal rate of return because this rate of return is internal to the project. Okay, so please pay attention. This rate of return is internal to the project. That's why it is called internal rate of return. I thank you very much for your uh, attention. I introduced internal rate of return to you today. And uh, in the last uh, few slides, I told you that look, internal rate of return is a relative measure. Uh, it's another analytical tool for evaluating different projects. 75% of the companies in the US, they're using IRR for project evaluation. So it's, it's a very, very uh, useful technique. It is something uh, in which 
the professionals are practicing uh, in the industry. So it's a very, very useful and important tool. Uh, at the end of the lecture, I told you that uh, internal rate of re uh, return, it's a relative measure. And PW, uh, AW, and FW, on the other hand, they are absolute measures. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask me those questions. Uh, you have my email. It is mazula at gk.edu.pk. Uh, for any administrative uh, questions or uh, any administrative help, please contact uh, Ms. Sabahad. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a wonderful day.